Good afternoon, and welcome to our first virtual town hall of 2018. As spring classes get underway this week, we're also kicking off the official launch of our new strategic plan titled Our Communities, Your College, Pathways for Student Success and a Stronger Indiana. I'm thrilled to see the strategic plan come to life, and thanks to so many of you for providing your input on the plan over the past year. An important uh, part of the development process was the President's Strategic Plan Advisory Council. We had planned to have one of the council members here to share with you today, Jonathan Combs, who is the Assistant Professor and Department Chair uh, for Design Technology for our Lafayette campus. Unfortunately, like many of you and your families, he's down with the flu right now. So we wish him well, uh, but he was not able to join us today. In his absence, I want to extend personally my thanks to the President's Strategic Planning Advisory Council, which included staff, faculty, and students. Membership of the Council included the folks listed above. The Council's role was to provide input on the process plans, to help develop and participate in stakeholder group meetings, to review the numerous strategic plan drafts, and to ensure that the plan's alignment was there with other important work of the College. Specifically, they were charged with ensuring appropriate levels of engagement by students, faculty, and employers, providing feedback on the strategic planning process and communi pro communicating progress to stakeholder groups. We appreciate it how active and engaged this group was in developing the strategic plan. The week of January 8th, you should have received a hard copy of this strategic plan on your campus. I encourage you to take the time to read it, specifically the goals and strategies, as well as the stories of success that are featured, sharing the amazing impact we have had on students, employers, and communities. For a more extensive look at the plan, including the videos, visit our strategic plan website at the link here. Later this month, we are sending the hard copy plan to more than 9,000 external stakeholders and community partners. We have presented the plan to Governor Holcomb, to the Higher Ed Commission, from, to the Department of Workforce Development, and we'll pre be presenting it later this month to our legislators in the General Assembly. At the same time, Kristen Moreland, Andy Bown, and I are traveling the state to present the strategic plan to our regional boards. The response has been overwhelmingly positive. We are committed to sharing our story and engaging those that share a common vision and interest in Hoosier prosperity. Now, we must look forward to the implementation of the plan. Yay! Through an application process, we identified teams of staff and faculty from across Ivy Tech to be leaders on the implementation of the plan. The strategy implementation teams are led by more than 50 individuals, a campus lead, and a systems office lead for each strategy. Each strategy also have that chancellor and a systems office cabinet member as sponsors. The team leads and sponsors for each strategy have identified numerous staff and faculty from across the state to participate in these teams. Thank you to all who have stepped forward to engage in this very important work. This formal implementation structure will help us to ensure that the plan is in fact a living, breathing document that we reference and use as a guide in the work we do. Our formal internal kickoff is on January 23rd, and those that have been identified as strategy leads and sponsors will attend that kickoff and work together as a statewide team to help determine the best way to move forward the implementation. You may be asking yourself, though, how does campus-level activity and the system-wide plan fit together? Well, joining me now to explain more about this is Kristen Moreland, our Vice President of Change Management and Strategic Initiatives. Welcome, Kristen. Thank you, Sue. This is my second time, so I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, first, as you mentioned, overarching strategies and tactics are planned at the systems level. To implement these tactics, campus leads and systems office leads will work together to develop college-wide projects, likely with pilots for campuses who are interested. You will be able to find continuous updates on the strategic plan on the website at MyIvy. Second, each campus has been asked to discuss the strategic plan on campus and identifies ways in which they can support the plan. Campuses will make plans based on their local needs to supplement the overarching goals and strategies. 
This encourages local empowerment for leadership on campus to choose the tactics that make the most sense for their community. Campuses are encouraged to work with their communities on plans that make the most sense. I am also attending each campus cabinet in the next two months to further explore how each campus might work to implement the strategic plan on, for the system as a whole. In addition, we have started working on the development of lead indicators to support the strategic plans college-wide five-year metrics. Let me take a minute to review what I mean by leading indicators and the best way to explain leading indicators is to start with an explanation of lag measures. So lag measures are tracking the measurement of our wildly important goals and they are frankly the numbers that we are losing sleep over. But once we receive the data on a lag measure and that report comes, it's over, we can't fix it. By the time we get that report, we understand that we should have done more around lead measures. So lead measures are very different. They measure the high impact things that our teams can do to reach a goal and they have three very specific characteristics. First, they're predictive, meaning that we're measuring something that leads us to our goal. Second, they're influenceable, meaning that the individual can do activities on a daily basis that will help make a change in the outcome of our goal. And third, they're quantifiable, meaning that we're quantifying behavior that drives our lag success. So it's important for us to focus our daily work on those lead measures. So let me walk you through an example that we can all probably relate to. Let's say you wanted to have a healthier lifestyle. Conceptually, that makes sense, but it's easier to understand if you put it into the context of a wildly important goal. So for this case, our wildly important goal would be reduce your weight from 200 pounds to 150 pounds by December 31st. Now that you have that goal, would you know specifically what you need to do in order to be healthier? You might, but you could also identify the battles that you could fight to win the war of being healthier. So the battles in this case are exercise, diet, drinking water, and self-care. Now that you've identified the battles, do you know exactly what you need to do? Maybe, but let's dig down deeper on exercise. If you decide to exercise without a specific target, that may work, but let's take it a step further. If you decide to visit the gym three times a week for 60 minutes and walk your dog for 20 minutes each night, now you know exactly what you need to do on a daily and a weekly basis to help reach the lag measure. These are the leading indicators for the wildly important goals. You'll start to hear more on your campuses in the near future about how to develop wildly important goals and leading indicators as we continue to work on the execution of the strategic plan. Helping to guide us through implementation of this operating system is the book, The Four Disciplines of Execution by Sean Covey and Chris McChesney. If you're interested in the full approach and the science behind it, we encourage you to read the book, which is available on amazon.com. Thank you, Kristen. Well, we now look forward to more discussions about the implementation of the plan and developing those wildly important goals and lead indicators in future town hall meetings. And as a reminder, information about the plan, its development, the implementation plan, and strategy leads are located in the employee dashboard of MyIvy in the strategic plan section. As you may already know, in 2019, just a year from now, Ivy Tech will go through the accreditation process with the Higher Learning Commission. Teams have been working for more than two years to prepare, and I have asked Dr. Marcus Kolb, Associate Vice President of College Accreditation, Academic Quality, and Learning Assessment, to provide us with an update. Welcome, Marcus. Thank you, Dr. Elsperman. I wanted to take a moment to update the college community on our progress in preparing for reaccreditation with the Higher Learning Commission. Many of you visited with me on your campuses a year ago to discuss the elements of accreditation and its importance to Ivy Tech, and the time has come to advance our preparation for this crucial process. Accreditation, or in our case reaccreditation, is the process of affirming our status with the Higher Learning Commission. In the spring of 2019, the Higher Learning Commission will dispatch a team of our peers, our peers being faculty and professionals from other institutions that are accredited by the Higher Learning Commission, and they'll send that team to Ivy Tech to review all parts of college practice and process. No part of Ivy Tech will go unexamined. 
with the visit team inquiring about student satisfaction, teaching and learning, business practices, foundation work, and learning support. It is important to know that no office or individual at Ivy Tech will be without a role in contributing to preparations, and anyone could be invited to speak with a visit team about their work with the college. Mm -hmm. Sounds stressful, right? So why do we do it? Well, accreditation has long been considered a hallmark of quality in higher education. Accredited institutions have publicly demonstrated that their work in teaching students and all of the supporting elements of that work is of high quality. Accredited colleges have the privilege of accepting federal Title IV financial aid dollars, that is grants and loans from the government. Without accreditation, we cannot accept these grant and loan dollars from our students and our very ability to function would be compromised. The good news is that we are already accredited. We've navigated this process successfully almost 10 years ago, and we have time to prepare to be successful again. Please mark your calendars for April 15th and 16th of 2019. This is our official visit date for the team that the Higher Learning Commission will send us. We expect, frankly, that other dates will be identified by the Higher Learning Commission, as they will likely wish to visit several of our campuses. But we know they will be with us on April 15th and 16th of next year, and many of you will be needed to help us to prepare for those dates, as well as meet with the visit teams on those dates. We count on all of you to be actively involved. We will learn more about exactly where and when the team expects to meet with us later this calendar year. As we learn more, we will certainly alert all of you. In the meantime, we have formed leadership teams in the systems office and on the campuses to make preparations. The most important of these preparations is composing two arguments. The compliance argument, which is to make sure we are following appropriate law, and the assurance argument, to make the case that our work is of great quality across all of our functions. We will submit these two arguments to the Higher Learning Commission and the visit team in March of 2019, about a month before they join us. The arguments will describe what we do and will use many examples as evidence to support our claims of quality. We have a draft of these arguments and we'll be asking you to help us improve them through reviewing them and even adding your own work to them over the next year. We have a busy 16 months in front of us and we need everyone to be aware of this work and prepared to help when called upon. Anytime you hear the word accreditation or see it as an agenda item, please pay close attention. Ivy Tech is a great place to work and study. We now need to make that case for the Higher Learning Commission and its visit team. We look forward to your help in preparing for April 15th and 16th of 2019. Thank you, Marcus, for your leadership and all the good work that's underway with the reaccreditation and I think you reflect the good work that is underway and we should be well on our way to that reaccreditation. So thank you. Because our town halls present a unique opportunity to connect you with some of the people you may have received emails from or heard of, of about from the system wide uh, emails, I have some of those folks in systems office share information through this venue directly to you. So I have asked Jen Fisher, who is the Assistant Vice President of Employee Benefits, to join us today for a brief review of the Ivy Tech Retirement Plan and a reminder to all of us about our options for voluntary contributions. Welcome, Jen. Thank you, Sue. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And good afternoon, faculty and staff. You may recall that in June of 2016, the college selected Transamerica Retirement Solutions as our retirement plan's record keepers. Transamerica offered significant reduction in record keeping fees, meaning more of the money in employees' accounts goes towards investing in their retirement. They also offered consolidated, comprehensive online education and planning tools and services, and more flexible investment options. Transamerica is not, does not manage any funds. They only record keep them. Therefore, there are no built-in conflicts of interest. Mm -hmm. The college has added new features to the plan. Employees can make after-tax Roth contributions to the 403B defined contribution plan. Unlike traditional pre-tax 403B contributions, with Roth, you can invest your after-tax dollars. Those dollars grow tax deferred, and the trade-off well, because those contributions are after tax, your take-home pay will be reduced by your investment. 
Additionally, employees can implement auto increase. This feature allows employees to schedule an increase to their retirement contribution without having to remember to log into their account every time a change is needed. Over 160 employees have elected the auto increase for their contribution. Jen, who can participate in the retirement plan? All full-time faculty and staff and all adjunct faculty and part-time staff can make voluntary contributions to the plan. This includes employees who are currently enrolled in PERF, the state of Indiana's defined benefit plan. So I know we have two plans to choose from. What's the difference between the plans? The college offers two ways employees can save for their retirement. The 403B defined contribution plan, and the which is the college contribution, mm -hmm. goes into the 403B plan for eligible employees, and the 457 deferred compensation plan. An employee can contribute to either the 403B plan or the 457B plan, or both. The IRS sets annual maximums for each of these two plans. The 457B plan is a good option for those who are currently contributing the maximum to the 403B plan or who have other retirement plans and still want to save more. Currently, over 1,300 employees are contributing to one or both plans. So do employees who have a balance with our former record keeper, Tia, have an option to move their balance to Transamerica? Absolutely. Transamerica retirement specialists can walk them through this process. There are no fees to move the balance from TIA to Transamerica. So what tools and resources can our employees access to help them figure out if they are saving enough? Well, there are several tools available to our employees. However, the most impactful is the OnTrack tool from Transamerica. The OnTrack tool provides you a visual, visual representation of your retirement outlook. It's a quick, personalized way to gauge your savings progress in real time. It allows you to set up your own goals and enter in outside investment information so you can get a complete picture of your retirement portfolio. We have seen a year-over-year -year increase in the number of our employees who have a positive retirement outlook. So what can employees do to ensure they are ready for retirement? That's a big question, and it's unique to the individual. Our goal is to give our employees the resources to help them prepare for their future. We include these resources as part of the new, uh, the college's new Be Lively Employee Wellbeing mm -hmm. Program. Mm -hmm. Let's start with Transamerica. Transamerica has a number of webinars and online tools that focus on how to create your retirement strategy. Employees can also speak directly with a retirement advisor to answer questions they may have. Additionally, the college has partnered with Frank Lies and Associates to provide overall financial education. Frank provides information on the basics of money management, retirement income planning, and the basics of estate planning. Frank is available for one-on-one -on -one meetings, in person, and via telephone. Finally, and this one I'm really proud of, are the retirement symposiums. The recently relaunched program is organized by Christine Butler, Assistant Director of Employee Benefits here in Systems Office. The symposium is held on each campus and is aimed at helping employees gather the important information in planning for their future. The event includes presentations from a variety of guest speakers and features topics such as financial planning, uh, the Social Security benefit process, which we know is difficult, can be, and the college's retiree benefit plan options. It also includes a live Q&A with a panel of Ivy Tech's own retirees. It focuses on the emotional and psychological aspects of preparing for retirement. The symposium is open to employees age 52 and above, and the employee can bring a guest. This past November, symposiums were, were held at our Evansville, Lawrenceburg, Sellersburg, and Indianapolis campuses. Over 100 employees and guests were able to attend. The next set of symposiums are scheduled for next month and includes Terre Haute, Richmond, and the Lafayette campuses. Sounds wonderful. So what's next for the retirement plan? Well, the retirement plan committee continues to oversee and monitor the plans to ensure they are operating in the most beneficial way possible. Additionally, we continue to work with our partners to develop tools and resources our employees can use to improve their retirement readiness. Be on the lookout for new resources around financial education coming this year. And I encourage employees to review the benefits website available through the My excuse me, through the employee channel in my Ivy for more detailed information. Jen, 
Thank you for sharing this important information regarding our retirement plans. While for some, retirement may seem a long way off, it is never too early to begin saving for retirement. As a member of our payroll steering committee, I wondered if you would take just a couple of minutes to give us an update on that pay frequency transition plan that we talked about several months ago. I know is coming up in April. It is, and thank you, Sue. I'm happy to do so. Last September, the college announced that it is transitioning to one pay frequency, which will be bi-weekly on a lag basis. Administrative faculty, which includes deans, and administrative staff currently paid on the semi-monthly pay frequency will be the first to, trans to transition this April. The change to the bi-weekly lag pay frequency will result in a four-week gap between regular pays. There are several options available to help employees through the transition. These options are specific to administrative faculty and staff making the transition this spring. Employees may elect to cash, up, up, in, cash in up to 80 hours of accrued vacation, elect a zero interest loan of up to 80 hours of pay, and or a combination of options one or two, not to exceed a total of 80 hours of pay via the loan vacation options. They may set aside funds each pay period to a personal bank account through direct deposit, or it simply choose to wait until the bi-weekly pay frequency begins, meaning not receive payment for a four-week period. Administrative faculty and staff can, can receive, expect to receive details in early February on the steps to take to select one of the options. Please refer to the supporting information available on the Human Resources page of MyIvy. Thank you, Jen, for all of that useful information. I'd now like to follow up on something we've discussed at previous town halls and for which you have submitted questions. During the September town hall, we mentioned that our testing centers would be undergoing a RASCI exercise to help determine where they best fit into the new organizational structure of the college. We are pleased to report that the exercise has been completed and the cross-functional team came back with a unanimous recommendation for the role of the testing centers. Having consistent reporting and processes for this area of the college is critical to maintaining academic integrity and quality, as well as ensuring that our testing-related services to our community and employers are exemplary as well. The testing centers play a critical role in supporting and measuring activity that links directly to the strategic plan goal of our students earning 50,000 high quality certifications, certificates, and degrees per year aligned with workforce needs. In fact, our testing centers uh, administer more than 10,000 industry certified tests per year in addition to their academic role. Testing services, as the department will now be called, will begin reporting through academic affairs at both a campus and systems office level. Dotted line reporting for the testing centers to systems office will be established and defined to help promote consistency across the, test, the testing center network. This new reporting will be complete by mid-February. Chancellors, vice chancellors of academic affairs, and others directly affected are already aware of this change. A full implementation plan for testing services is being developed with full rollout planned over the next few months. I'd like to thank all those who participated in the testing center process review that occurred actually a couple years ago was very integral and important in the most recent RASCI work as well. Another topic you have submitted questions about is Amplify, our employee engagement survey. I wanted to take just a couple of minutes today to update you. We continue to see such a strong sense of caring and commitment by so many of you. We had a resounding 81% response rate to our September survey and just over 1,300 written responses uh, for our selected campus follow-up survey in November. Several themes have emerged that include faculty chairs reporting workload as unbalanced, of which we actually have early recommendations that will re be reviewed with faculty council in February to make some improvements here. A second issue was uncertain futures as a result of the enrollment decline and reorganization. A need for autonomy through accountability of one's role and responsibility and desire for a system that rewards job performance. So recall that the Amplify survey is kind of like taking our temperature 
once in the spring, once in the fall. You tell us how you're feeling about your engagement. The Pulse survey, on the other hand, that open-ended question you received in November, helped us to diagnose specific concerns you have. Thank you again for your strong participation in our Amplify surveys and to continue to provide feedback from which we can work together to make Ivy Tech a great place to work and contribute to such a critical mission. Your campus leadership teams are working through the concerns raised on your campus. We take your feedback seriously and thank you in advance for your continued feedback. One of the ways we have been working to foster engagement throughout the college is in solving problems through the introduction of Simplex, a creative problem solving methodology. To date, we have had 62 fuzzy situations as we call them. These are actually opportunities or problems, if you will, that have been identified and we've used Simplex to complete. Uh, we have completed more than 39 sessions, 17 more have been assigned or are in progress, and we have six more sessions in the queue. Many of you have participated in Simplex training here at Ivy Tech. We have had over 140 faculty and staff members participate in Simplex 1, and over 50 faculty and staff participate in Simplex 2 facilitator training. An exciting opportunity once Simplex 2 has been completed is the ability to become a certified facilitator. We currently have 23 individuals going through that certification process. So here's where you can both help and find benefit. With these 23 individuals pursuing that certification as facilitators, we have the capacity to solve even more fuzzy situations. If you have a fuzzy situation, fuzzy situation or a concern or an opportunity in mind, please submit a brief description at the link listed on the slide. There will also be future opportunities for Simplex training. More information on that will come in the email from our talent development team. As I travel the state and visit with you on campus, one of the highlights of my role is hearing about the really great work that is ha happening on every campus and then being able to share some of this as best practices. One such example is scheduling advising appointments during class in an effort to keep our current students on track to complete that degree. Here's what Lawrenceburg is doing. They strategically target certain classes general education courses with high enrollment and entry-level program courses. The staff then works with the instructor on the best time to visit their classroom. During the two weeks before registration opens, they have laptops on carts decorated with posters around registration opening dates and visit the classrooms. They make appointments for students to meet with their advisor to register and give them an appointment reminder card with a little blurb about everything the advising center can do to help them. During the spring 2017 semester, they connected with 39% of their students in this way. Of their student population, 28% made appointments right then, and 11% didn't for various re reasons, such as the fact they were transferring or graduating, or they might have been a guest student. During the fall 2017 semester, they again reached out to 39% that way. 27% of their student population made appointments to meet with an advisor during the first three or four weeks of registration opening. Lawrenceburg has seen an impact in retention rates as a result of this, and they don't have as many students rushing in right as the semester starts to get registered, only then to find that the classes have filled or have been canceled. The timing of these efforts also present a great opportunity to check in with the students and see how their progress is going in their classes while there is still time to seek tutoring or intervention. Another benefit, the advising department has developed such a great collaboration with the faculty through this project. Staff reports that they enjoy having the opportunity to see how faculty interact with students, learn more about the teaching style of those faculty, and in general, see that instructor in their element. While we've highlighted Lawrenceburg today, we know other campuses are also doing this practice and many more will be starting this practice uh, in the spring. So shortly after I began at Ivy Tech, I heard about the exciting work OIT was doing to identify within the first two weeks of classes 
which of our students were at risk of not passing their courses. I challenged the team to develop a process to use that data, from which Project Early Success was born. As we are about to begin our fourth semester of this initiative, it is a great time to update everyone on where we've been and where we're going. As you may remember, we have awarded a prize each semester to the region or the campus earning the top position in the metrics categories. The inaugural winner was Columbus, followed by Terre Haute last spring. I'm happy to report the winning campus for this fall is Richmond. <laughs> I'm joined today by the Richmond Campus Chancellor, Chad Bolser, who has with him the traveling Ivy Oscar that is awarded to each team's winning campus. Welcome, Chad, and congratulations, Richmond Campus. Thank you, Sue. Now, although it's an honor to accept the Ivy Oscar on behalf of the Richmond faculty and staff, and a little scary, <laughs> it's important to remember why so many of our employees worked for this award. It's really all about student success. Whether it's through a phone call, an email, an in-person meeting after class or in your office, or using technology to interact in, one, in another manner, we know that students that have been identified as a part of Project Early Success, who engage in a person in some manner were 3.7% more likely to pass their class than those on the list whom we did not make contact. We make an impact every time we connect with students, and that will be the goal, the continued goal moving forward. This spring will also mark the first time Project Early Success will be entirely campus-based. This means that there will be an additional opportunities for you to get involved. So please reach out to your campus coordinator if you would like to participate. And don't worry, training will be available to those making phone calls, a script will be provided, so even if you haven't made phone calls in the past, now is a great time to join in on the action. In addition, the list of Project Early Success students will also be available within NEWT. Now this is an important change and it will give us the ability to know which students may need additional interventions determined by the Project Early Success algorithm during the weeks we actively make phone calls to those students, but also on an ongoing basis. Now be prepared. The Richmond campus is not going to give up the Ivy Oscar without a fight. Project Early Success Outreach will take place during the weeks of January 29th and February 5th. So consider this a challenge. Your campus could be that campus that earns the trophy next, but only if you can take it away from Richmond. And we don't plan to make that easy. <laughs> Thank you, Chad, for throwing down the gauntlet for Project Early Success. I'm looking forward to making calls myself and am so happy to see the enthusiasm our campus teams have when connecting to students on this very important project. Thank you. Well, that brings us to the end of another town hall. I want to thank you all for joining us today as we wrap up the end of a busy first week of classes. Enjoy the warm up that's coming this weekend and please join us for next month's town hall on February 9th.